Last Friday, North Korea test-fired an intercontinental ballistic missile reportedly capable of carrying a nuclear warhead to strike the U.S.'s mainland. So how are pundits assessing the frequency and intensity of Pyongyang's provocations? What are the prospects with regard to an appropriate UN Security Council response on this Monday? And why have existing sanctions against North Korea failed to rein in its brinkmanship? Welcome to Issues and Insiders. Today we address North Korea's alarming acts of aggression, uh, including its missile launches and a possible seventh nuclear test in the near future. For more, I have Dr. Kim Yang-Yu at the East Asia Institute. Dr. Kim, it's a pleasure to have you with us. It's my pleasure to be here. Right. I also have Mr. Evans Revere, former acting U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, on the line as well. Mr. Revere, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Dr. Kim, as media reports say, North Korea conducted a record number of missile launches this year, and on November 2nd, it launched the most projectiles in its history on a single day. How do you explain the frightening frequency, if I may, and intimidating intensity of these alarming acts of provocation, as well as the appearance of Kim Jong-un's young daughter at the site of Friday's launch location. Well, I think the immediate cause of this month's unprecedented number of missile launches by North Korea was the Biden administration's uh, NPR, Nuclear Posture Review, released last month on October 27th to reassure U.S. allies and the reason the NPR concluded uh, included a stern warning any nuclear attack by North Korea against the United States or its allies and partners is unacceptable and will result in the end of that regime. And to this, the DPRK foreign ministry spokesman responded on October 30th that the U.S. the one and only country in the world which sets it as a main target of nuclear strategy to topple the government of a sovereign state must be prepared for paying an equal price for its, its attempt to use military force against the DPRK. And DPRK Foreign Minister Choi Son he also warned on November 17th that the stronger forces Washington provides to its allies, the fiercer the DPRK's military counteraction will be in direct proportion to it. So we are witnessing the classic example of the spiral on the Korean Peninsula. Pyongyang intensifying missile and nuclear threats, and Washington respond by strengthening the extended turns to its allies which triggers more aggressive provocations of North Korea. And underlying causes of this unprecedented level of prov- provocation are threefold, I think. First, the Washington's deterrence failure in Ukraine and subsequent effort to support Kyiv's victory in war emboldened U.S. adversaries on the other side of the continent to take more aggressive measures. Second, as demonstrated and also mentioned by you, uh, Hwasong 17 test firing last Friday, Kim Jong-un is now confident that Pyongyang has secure, reliable power, power projection capability alone with his nuclear capability. And that's why I think he brought his own daughter uh, to show that he's confident about this capability. And third, I think the provocation also could attest to the seriousness of the living condition of North Korean people after the self-imposed isolation and strict border control to fight the pandemic. And Kim Jong-un might need some military achievement to quell possible complaints of North Korean people. Right. And Mr. Revere, going back to the ICBM launch last Friday, now this is reportedly capable of reaching the U.S. And that being said, the U.S. has called for a U.N. Security Council meeting on this Monday. Now, back in May, U.S. efforts to strengthen sanctions against North Korea were vetoed by China and Russia. Do you envision a consensus this time around? Quite frankly, no. Uh, I think a UN Security Council resolution to condemn North Korea or to impose additional sanctions on the DPRK is is highly unlikely. Uh, Moscow and Beijing have become very strong supporters of and and even advocates for the North Korean regime today. And both Russia and China, in my view, appear to see an advantage uh, deriving from the fact that North Korea's growing nuclear and missile Uh, arsenals and its provocative behavior. Uh, These things complicate the security calculations of the United States, the Republic of Korea, and Japan. So to the extent that Pyongyang's behavior creates challenges for the United States and its allies in the region, I think we should expect uh, China and Russia to maintain their current practice of looking the other way uh, as the DPRK continues to violate UN Security Council resolutions. 
right. And Dr. Kim, perhaps that is why some pundits say North Korea's blatant breach of UN Security Council resolutions have well exposed the Council's failings. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I totally agree with what uh, uh, Mr. Revere just said. And the Russia-Ukraine war has revealed the significant limitations and incompetence of the UN when it comes to fighting against the aggression of a veto player in the Security Council with credible nuclear capabilities. I believe the failure to adopt the Security Council resolution condemning Russian attempt to unlawfully annex four regions of Ukraine on September 30th is a deja vu of what happened in the League of Nations after the Manchurian and Abyssinian crisis in 1931. With the support of other authoritarian regimes like China and North Korea, as Mr. Review already mentioned, Russia successfully dismantled the global governance that has functioned relatively well since World War II. So we all saw that international communities attempt to hold North Korea accountable for its unlawful launch of ICBM in May has failed as China and Russia vetoed the draft of UN Security Council resolution. So unfortunately, I strongly suspect that UN could do anything to stop North Korean provocation, at least in the near future. Right. And keeping in mind what's been shared thus far, Mr. Revere, do you believe reform of the UN Security Council will perhaps then allow for a broader, tangible resolution to some of the world's pending security concerns, including, of course, North Korea? That's a very big question. Uh, the UN Security Council's inability or unwillingness uh, to act on key challenges to international security, like North Korea, like Russia's war on Ukraine, this has raised uh, some serious questions about the effectiveness of, of the institution. Uh, the fact that veto holding powers of the Security Council can effectively block international consensus uh, and block international action uh, against those in violation of the Security Council's own resolutions and even of the United Nations Charter itself is the unfortunate reality that we, we face today. Having said that, it's, it's really hard to imagine any serious institutional reform of the UN Security Council occurring at this point, uh, especially since such reform would require the support of the very powers that are undermining the effectiveness of the institution. So I'm, I'm very uh, pessimistic about the prospect for reform, and uh, I just don't think we're going to be seeing that anytime soon. Right, I see. Dr. Kim, North Korea's six nuclear tests back in the year 2017 led to sanctions agreed upon by all members of the UN Security Council, including China and Russia. Why have these sanctions failed to rein in Pyongyang's provocations? Well, the simple answer is because North Korea has learned how to bypass international sanctions. For example, North Korea has been using illegal ship-to-ship -ship transfer between Chinese and North Korean vessels in the Yellow Sea before the pandemic to circumvent sanctions. And now they are doing more uh, uh, dramatic things. North Korea is considered as one of the four main state-based cyber threats alongside China, Russia, and Iran. And crypto analysis firm Chain Analysis estimated that Pyongyang stole approximately $1 billion in the first nine months of this year, including the FBI confirmed case of stealing $620 million in the cryptocurrencies from a popular video game in March this year. And in July, Ann Uberger, uh, U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor for Cybersecurity, said that North Korea uses cyber to gain up to a third, a third of their funds for their missile program. Now, I believe that there is a keen awareness of serious of this uh, situation. I really, I'm really happy to hear that the South Korean United States held a joint forum last Thursday on how to counter crypt, uh, cryptocurrency theft and other illegal sub activities of North Korea. We really need to find a way to stop this. Otherwise, it will become increasingly more difficult to contain North Korean military provocation in the future. Right. Meanwhile, Mr. Revere, following talks with his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, U.S. President Joe Biden claimed it's unclear if China can stop a North Korean nuclear test. Now, some believe China can, but it's simply choosing to keep North Korea as a strategic buffer, if I may, against U.S. influence in the region. Do you agree? Well, we've come a long way since 2017 when China's cooperation was key to the UN Security Council and the international community's ability to act against North Korean provocations. 
Since then, uh, China's position has fundamentally changed. Today, Beijing is placing a priority on maintaining good relations with Pyongyang. And today, in the context of seriously problematic U.S.-China relations, the Chinese see a tactical and strategic advantage to supporting North Korea. It's, it's that simple. So we should not expect Beijing to use its leverage on North Korea. But let's also remember uh, that experience over the decades tells us that Pyongyang has often opted to ignore advice and pressure from China. So I suspect that what President Biden was getting at uh, was that, that even uh, previous efforts on the part of the Chinese to influence the North Koreans uh, have often co come to naught. And uh, I don't think that uh, is going to change. Dr. Kim, President Yoon Yeol has highlighted the importance of a rules-based order in his Indo-Pacific strategy, echoing the words of his U.S. counterpart. What do you suppose is meant by the phrase rules-based order as used by President Yoon amid the security concerns here on the Korean Peninsula? Well, I believe it is for making a nuanced statement on Seoul's position in between the intensified strategic competition between Washington and Beijing, uh, frankly speaking. Uh, while the U.S. has been uh, seeking to build a secret framework that connects and combines the strategic resources in Europe and in the Pacific, China continues to disrupt the rise of global network containing the authoritarian regimes, including Beijing. This is why Xi Jinping emphasized the importance of keeping the industrial and supply chain stable and unclogged whenever he had a chance to talk with leaders at the G20 Bali summit last week. So the term rule-based order, of course, it is leaning toward Washington for sure, as you just mentioned, but it has some flexibility compared to the free and open in the Pacific of Japanese government that puts democratic values at the center of the principle. So South Korea will seek to establish a rule-based order in economy, technology, uh, environment, and security issues based on the principle of inclusiveness, trust, and reciprocity. This is not a unique position of Seoul, of course, but other countries like Germany, other European countries, and ASEAN countries take a similar approach. And the U.S. National Security Strategy also emphasizes the importance of building the strongest possible coalitions and the need to build a stable and open rule-based order that respects um, sovereignty and territory integrity of states and strongly to approve of aggression and coercion, which is similar to what President Yoon Sung-yeol already mentioned. Uh, last week at the ASEAN summit. So I think this is a more nuanced p pivot to the United States. Right. Also, with regard to regional concerns, Mr. Revere, trilateral talks among South Korea, the U.S. and Japan have pledged an unparalleled response in the event of a seventh nuclear test by North Korea. What response might these three countries resort to? Mm. Well, there are a range of things that uh, may be under consideration. Uh, we might see, for example, new or expanded uh, military exercises between and among uh, the three powers. Uh, we might see new military deployments by the United States, including of U.S. Uh, strategic assets to the area. Uh, either of those things or both of those things together would put an additional burden on, on North Korea, which, of course, is compelled to respond whenever we conduct exercises. Uh, and this, of course, uh, uh, leads to uh, deterioration of their military capabilities because uh, there's a lot of pressure on them. Uh, we might also see uh, a program of more aggressive sanctions aimed at the regime's finances, uh, a more aggressive and comprehensive international approach, for example, to stopping uh, the uh, North Korean exploitation of the international banking and financial system, including cryptocurrency markets, to fund its nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs. There might also be covert steps uh, that the United States and others could take, but uh, it's probably best not to discuss those in a, in a forum like this. But the key to any effective response, in my view, is to adopt measures that demonstrate to Pyongyang that its attempt to become a full-fledged nuclear power is not going to enhance North Korean security, but it's rather going to undermine it. That's the key to the success of any sanctions and pressure program going forward. Right, and hopefully North Korea is listening to your words, Mr. Revere. Thank you very much for your time today and your thoughts. And Dr. Kim, thank you very much for your insights today. Thank you for having me. Right, well, on that note, we end this edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching. Do join us again same time tomorrow.